We've been having a discussion about uh, a case of a woman who was diagnosed of having pancreatic pain and some evidence of chronic pancreatitis. And I think it's important to spend a little bit of time talking about how a diagnosis of pancreatitis is made and how it is staged. You have a lot of experience in doing this. What is your approach to the diagnosis and staging of chronic pancreatitis? I think the case that we discussed brings forward a lot of the significant challenges that we have in making a diagnosis, particularly early in the clinical course. So I think for many patients, it's not difficult to reach a diagnosis. Um, a CAT scan is probably the test that's used at most institutions, and it's quite accurate at making a diagnosis in patients that have relatively far advanced disease. So the finding of pancreatic atrophy or diffuse calcifications or those types of features are, are, um, are present in, in many patients with far advanced and long-standing disease and a CAT scan's quite accurate in those group. The challenge I think is, is as in the patient we presented earlier which is in the early stages of disease because most of the tests that are available for clinicians to use are imaging studies. They look at the structure of the gland so you have CAT scan, you have MRI, or uh, often with the addition of MRCP, um, you have endoscopic ultrasonography, you have ERCP, and these tests look at both the pancreatic duct as well as the parenchyma, but changes in the duct and the parenchyma don't occur in many patients early in the disease course, so those changes are invisible uh, to tests like CT and MRI and ERCP. So these structural uh, tests are useful in confirming a diagnosis after irreversible damage has been done and the disease has progressed to uh, a level in which there's scarring and distortion of the gland. So they're not very good for early diagnosis. And that's why it's so important to think about diagnosis and staging almost together. Mm -hmm. um, because if we strive for diagnosis, what we should be striving for is early diagnosis. Right. If we strive for late diagnosis, we'll have accurate diagnosis, but we won't have any therapeutic uh, options at that point. I think within the tests of structure that probably endoscopic ultrasonography gives the most detailed information right now. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, but it does demonstrate uh, usually earlier in the clinical course some changes which can be visualized. The challenge I believe is that many patients may have these subtle abnormalities in their pancreas who we might not want to label as having chronic pancreatitis, um, including folks as they age, patients with diabetes, patients with renal insufficiency, and a variety of other situations. So endoscopic ultrasound is probably our best, but it's not good enough really for early diagnosis. There's also quite a bit of disagreement, it seems, among even expert uh, in um endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, how do you interpret this, this uh, difference in opinion or uh, can you make a firm diagnosis based on one person's evaluation? I think it's challenging. There's a lot of subjectivity in endoscopic ultrasonography, which means there's both inter and intra-observer variability. I think at the ends of the spectrum, when the gland looks completely normal or when the gland looks terrible, mm -hmm. we have a lot of confidence in those results. The challenge, I think, is in the middle. So in the old way of looking at endoscopic ultrasound, if there are three or four criteria of the nine, that's very much a gray zone and it's very difficult to know what to make of that. There have been some efforts to try to produce new EUS criteria, the so-called Rosemont criteria, but they really haven't been studied sufficiently at this point to know whether they're any better than the, than the old criteria. You also have a problem of not having a gold standard to compare it with, so that's another issue. Yes, as, as in this field, all studies essentially compare one diagnostic test to another diagnostic test as opposed to everyone comparing against the same gold standard. There are a variety of tests that are available to measure the function of the gland separate from the structure of the gland. The ones that are widely available generally only become abnormal again very late in the clinical course. So that would be a fecal elastase, mm -hmm. um, which uh, will drop to a level below 200 uh, as the disease progresses. And typically that occurs in patients 
who have uh, already developed exocrine insufficiency as a consequence of their disease, no, or serum trypsin. Right, so the, uh, just the fecal elastase, there's also a problem with false positive and false negative. What kind of things will uh, give you uh, false positive and false negative as results? The biggest false positive probably is when the, it is diluted. Mm -hmm. So in, in patients that have diarrhea or significant watery stool, the enzyme will be diluted and it'll be falsely uh, low. But there are a variety of other interesting situations where fecal elastase is often low. It's very low often in patients with diabetes mellitus. So the question that comes up is, is it a false, falsely low right. lab, laboratory test? Or is there something abnormal in pancreatic function in patients with diabetes, or both? Um, so there are a lot of situations where fecal elastase can be uninterpretable. And again, if it's very high, you know, 400, 500, it's helpful. If it's very low, 100, let's say, it's quite helpful. In that gray range in the middle, you sometimes wonder. There is a, a test, a pancreatic function test, where you actually stimulate the pancreas, as you know, and collect pancreatic secretions. Um, this is a little bit different in that it's not measuring uh, exocrine failure or endocrine failure. It's measuring uh, the maximum uh, secretory capacity of the gland, but it's, it's not available uh, at most places. And I would guess there's just a handful of places in the United States that are doing that test. What's the name of that test? It's a secret and test would be the, the, the name that most people would, would know it by. Uh, it has been done utilizing in a variety of different ways. The, uh, probably the way it's done most commonly now is using an endoscope, an, an, an endoscope uh, to collect the fluid. Um, uh, but it's, uh, we think that anyway that it can detect patients a little bit earlier in their clinical course where there might be some opportunity. This is uh, the test that used to use the old Dryling tubes, which were very cumbersome and, and uh, difficult for the patients to endure. And the dry leaf tubes are still around. We still use them, right. although they are still difficult and difficult for the patient to endure. So that hasn't changed over time. Um, and it's a lot uh, more tolerable uh, to collect the fluid by endoscopic techniques. Um, so this is a, a technique that could occur. It could be, could be uh, utilized by clinicians at more places than it currently is. Okay, so uh, we've talked about structural diagnosis, uh, functional diagnosis. Uh, this particular patient that we had talked about earlier had a pain syndrome that seemed to be associated with a uh, rise in amylase or lipase from time to time and had characteristics. So uh, that perhaps could be another sign, uh, but it's not really a diagnostic uh, uh, test as well. So uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, using uh, genetic testing for uh, making a diagnosis, and uh, genetic testing doesn't really make a diagnosis, what it does is tells you a patient is at risk for developing pancreatitis. And we, uh, if you have a patient, for example, who had, um, uh, let's say, two or three endoscopic ultrasound criteria, and you're saying it's a little bit equivocal, but then I told you they had a test that showed that they had mutations in the cystic fibrosis gene or a trypsin gene or a spink gene, uh, that really changes the confidence that you have. It's actually uh, the, the uh, functional changes are associated with real disease. It changes the probability that uh, you're actually uh, looking at a real disease. So combining uh, risk with evidence of uh, disease really helps both tests. And I think in any diagnostic test, if you know the pretest probability in a patient or a population, it's very helpful in figuring out uh, how you, much you can rely on the test and what the test result means. So I think in a patient as we described where there was a clinical syndrome which was highly suggestive or in a patient that had a genetic background that was highly suggestive, you would be, uh, the, the clinician would be faced with a much higher pretest probability and would have much more value the result of a positive diagnostic test than in a patient with a low pretest probability. So I think in all uh, you know, diseases and diagnosis, having that information is very helpful. So we're also interested in staging, and part of that is just looking at the progression of disease over time. And unfortunately, we don't have good sensitive tests to do that. We would like to be able to see that uh, combined with an early diagnosis is an intervention that changes the clinical course so that they don't progress 
but you have to have a biomarker in order to determine whether or not your, your uh, treatments are effective. And really, pain is about the only one that we uh, have that uh, you know, is, is a, a good indicator of, of uh, control of the disease uh, because things like CAT scans and, and uh, ERCPs take too much time and they're too invasive. So that's another area that uh, we'll have to work on in the next uh, 10 years. Right, and I think that endpoint of, uh, of using a CAT scan as the endpoint, um, it, doesn't it really miss the boat, though, that if we're trying to measure whether our therapies are effective, if we wait and see till they've totally failed, I mean, it's, we've kind of entirely missed the boat. What we need to know is earlier to say our therapy's failing or our therapy's effective, we should keep it up. Um, and that's, I think, those, those middle biologic markers where we really need the most work. Very good. Thank you for uh, the discussion.